Uh, Our new normal uh, feels anything but, doesn't it? What was first touted as uh, two weeks to flatten the curve, right? Two weeks? Hey, two weeks, everybody. Just stay home, flatten the curve. Uh, Has us now needing vaccine passports to enter private businesses. Working from home seems to be here to stay for so many People that thought they'd be back to the office, nope, you're, you're still at home. Masks in schools, two meters between you and anyone who's not a part of your household. Uh, hugs, handshakes, and high fives are a thing of the past, uh, let alone all the thing I was worried about. You know, the, the double kiss thing that I was kind of worried about when I first got here? That's not, it's not even an issue. It's not, it's not even a concern. Our new normal feels anything but. And if you haven't come to this conclusion on your own, I'm sorry to be the one to say it, but there is no end in sight. There is no date that we can carve into stone that will mark the time when everything will be back the way it was. The idea that herd immunity could be achieved has been functionally abandoned. There is no vaccine rate that will magically guarantee that a a switch will get flipped, right? And the cloud that COVID has cast over us will in some way dissipate. I don't know if ever we will legally be allowed to meet in a group that matches our fire code, which a little sign at the back there says 244 with seats. I don't know when we'll be in a legal position uh, where those who want to sing without a mask can do so. I don't know when. Uh, We'll be able to pass plates with the bread and cup on it as brothers and sisters to one another. Uh, I don't know when you will see a baptism performed where some form of personal protective equipment, that PPE that we've heard so much about, is not being worn. Some of you know that uh, while pastoring in my previous church for about seven years, I was also the executive director of a, of a foundation that funded various humanitarian initiatives. Humanitarian initiatives usually deal in disaster, and disaster is just that, disaster. It's terrible. An earthquake or a flood or a hurricane can make it th- so that things that once worked no longer do. In some cases, houses and schools and hospitals uh, are rebuilt just where they fell because uh, that's just where they were before. But often is the case that those in charge of rebuilding see the opportunity that exists to build differently, to look at things from a different angle because they believe it will better serve the people in need. COVID has been a disaster for many churches. Uh, If you know of churches in other places or if you're kind of Walking in that world in some way, you know that it's been a disaster to many churches. Uh, From my perspective, many have been decimated because the systems they have built only worked when the world knew a sense of relative stability. Others have been decimated as a result of their shaky faith. One that reduced the gathering of God's people to be on par with meeting up with a, a social group of one, some form or another. One where gospel engagement, let alone gospel growth, was secondary at best to simply making sure that they ran the programs as they always had, that the regularly scheduled programs functioned with religious certainty. What should have been the main things weren't the main things, and so they found themselves on shaky ground even before the pandemic hit. When rebuilding, it's easiest to put things back where they once were, but it's not always best. You see, the Bible speaks very little about programs. It doesn't give us a plan for a strategic plan. Nothing wrong inherently with programs or thinking intentionally about what we ought to do, but the scriptures just don't drive us in that direction. The clearest link we we have between anything programmatic refers to uh, making sure that Christian widows were being taken care of. And the other refers to the regular collection of funds to support Christians in other places who are facing persecution on behalf of the gospel. Other than that, the church wasn't a well-oiled machine. It didn't have glossy invitations to the next worship experience. It just wasn't there. It was women and men, various ages and stages and walks of life, who had been changed by the good news, who gathered to pray and to proclaim the gospel. And that's what gospel means, good news, right? It's good news that though they were guilty of all kinds of sin against a holy God, that same holy God whom they had sinned against had forgiven them in Christ. 
Jesus, the second person in the Trinity, conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin, took on flesh and lived the perfect life that you and I could not, cannot, and will not live. Why? That he could offer his life as a once-for-all sacrifice which would restore the relationship that had been broken between you and I and God. All of this happened according to the Scriptures in real time, just the way God said it would happen. And as our passage today will will make known, it is this message that we are to proclaim and it is this message that we are to pray in light of. Prayer and proclamation. Two things that should mark you and I as Christians and should mark us as a church. With your Bible open, I'll invite you, if you're able to, to stand with me for the reading of God's word this morning. We're in Colossians chapter four, looking at verses two to four. If you'd stand with me for the reading of God's word. God's word says this. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. This is God's word. You may be seated as I pray for us. Father in heaven, we do now uh, what we often find difficulty uh, doing, and that is pray. We pray because you hear us and you love us. You have told us this. And so we ask here our prayer this morning to use the moments that we have to grow us in our love for Jesus and our love for one another. Embolden us by your spirit, I pray. In Christ's name, amen. If you are a Christian... It is expected that prayer will be a part of your life. If you are a Christian, it is expected that proclamation will be a part of your life. Now, it can be the case that when we hear a passage that directs us as a Christian to pray or make the gospel known, we can start to feel a little uncomfortable. Maybe we start to feel even a little bit guilty. We feel guilty because we don't do it nearly as much as we believe we ought to if, in fact, we do it at all. We think of prayer and proclamation as things engaged by those uh, maybe more fanatic parts of our family. You know, those ones that do that. (laughs) And so a sermon like this can cause us to squeam. It can cause us to stiffen up and simply wait for the awkwardness to be over. We may even want to avoid talking about it at all because we think that we have disappointed God or worse, made him angry in our actions. Our guilt around these things brings about feelings of condemnation and actually keeps us from drawing close to God. I don't know if you've ever felt like that. But the gospel tells us that the condemnation of God related to our sin has been removed in Christ. And so when we fall short, we don't run from God. No, he is a good father. Instead, we run to him. Two things. If you are a Christian, it is expected that prayer will be a part of your life. If you are a Christian... It is expected that proclamation will be a part of your life. And if these are two things that should mark us as individuals, how much more should they mark us as a people together? As a church where where prayer is a part of the breath of what we do and we're proclaiming the gospel to both those who are lost and and to one another is just a part of who we are. It's just what we do. Look back to verse 2 of our passage with me. It says, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Devoting oneself to anything means that you are committed to it. A a devoted husband works to ensure that his wife knows that he loves her, supports her, is concerned for her needs. A devoted mom works to make sure that, that her kids know that she loves them, supports them, and is concerned for their needs. A devoted student studies well, attends class, and does their work. A devoted athlete like the ones we've seen at the Olympic and Paralympic Games over the last uh, month, they work for years to become a fraction of a second faster. Implicit in being devoted to something means giving attention to and working at it so that it might improve. But it also infers that there is inherently a positive inclination towards whatever it is you're devoted to. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to be devoted to it. And the call to God's people throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New, is that they be devoted to prayer. That prayer be a marker of them being a Christian. 
The expectation is that Christians will pray. Jesus made this clear on several occasions, but I think most notably is in his teaching in Matthew 6 and what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Four times in four verses, he says, and when you pray, but when you pray, and when you pray, this then is how you are to pray. (laughs) Four times in four verses, the expectation is that, Christian, you're going to pray. Next week, we're actually going to begin a series that will take us until the end of October, that's going to focus on the various ways that God's word calls us as a people to pray. And we're going to see how these different ways can be worked out in our midst as Hudson Community Baptist Church. But for now, how can we do what Colossians 4 is telling us to do, to devote ourselves to prayer, being watchful and being thankful? In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, the idea of this devotion is spoken of in an ongoing action. It says, pray continually. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that we do nothing but pray. Of course not. The New Testament gives us all sorts of things as Christians that we are to do. But I think it's fair to say that talking to God and thinking about God should be, as one writer says, is that thing that's always peeking over our shoulder, always ready to take the place of what we're concentrating on. Think about this. What would it mean for us as a church if this became the case for us? Where prayer became as invasive in our lives as COVID has, but is as welcomed as time with an old friend. What would that mean for us as a church? What would it mean for prayer to become a part of the breath of this church. Not in that formulaic, okay, let's, let's say grace so everyone can eat and not feel awkward kind of way, but where it would be the normal expectation that those conversations that we have after worship together would end with people praying about the very thing that they just spoke about. Where when you're having a rough day and you can think of a, a dozen people who you could call in the church and say, can you pray for me? Listen, I am... I am struggling with this today. I I just fell in this way today. Can you pray for me? I'm struggling with this. Can you pray for me? And the person on the other end of the line or the one that's reading the text would with joy pray for you and with you. Absolutely, they would say. What would it say about the health of us as as a Christian community if during a time of corporate prayer, one where we are all together, There weren't awkward pauses as everyone waits for the people that everyone knows will eventually pray out loud. But instead, there is a collision of people all trying to pray whose words are bumping into one another. What would it mean if the people of Hudson Community Baptist Church became known as a people who offer to pray for people who are not a part of Hudson Community Baptist Church? What would it mean for HCBC to become a place where those who are not even Christians thought to call when crisis hit because they heard that that we were a people who prayed for people in tight spots. Here's what I think would happen. I think that you and I would grow in our faith. And I think you and I would start looking and sounding a lot more like Jesus. I also think that the prayers that you and I would pray would start sounding more and more like the prayers that Jesus prayed, ones that had the glory of God in mind. Because our relationship with our Father, which is first and foremost fostered through word-directed prayer, would become closer. And who among us wouldn't have liked to have been closer with our earthly father? Who would want to be closer to their dad? How much better is it to be close with our Heavenly Father? Well, like anything, to be devoted to something Uh, To be known as this would require work and commitment. Like most things at the beginning, the effort might feel forced and even tiring. But just like exercise is hard at the beginning, eventually it becomes something our body knows to do and becomes stronger in doing it. You see, our spirit is strengthened through prayer. On more than one occasion, I have entered into a time of prayer with other Christians and felt both Physically zonked, that's a technical word, zonked, and spiritually depleted. Uh, I didn't even really want to show up uh, because I was feeling so tired and in some ways just so discouraged. But I went to pray with other Christians because that's what God's word tells me to do. And, And through the prayers of other men and women who follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit ministered to my soul 
It's not that I wasn't tired on the other end of it. But God used that time to refocus my heart and my mind on his holiness and the grace he has afforded me through Christ. If you are a Christian, prayer is expected. But the reality is that many of us have known long seasons where we haven't prayed. There are a number of reasons for this, ones that we'll be talking more about in the weeks to come. But I think one of those that's worth touching on right now is because there's been a known area of sin in our lives. If you're not praying, it could be the case that it's not because you don't yearn for it in some way, but because you are harboring sin in your life and you know that honestly praying exposes that sin. And it might be a sin that you have come to lean on because it's made life easier for you in some way. It could even be a sin that you have come to love. The driest times of prayer in my own life have been when there has been some aspect of sin that I have afforded safe harbor in my heart. Usually an anger toward another person or a bitterness about a situation that I have just let take root. There is no greater kryptonite to prayer than is sin. Now the irony of this is that it is through the prayers, through prayers of confession and repentance that we, are free, that we are freed from the functional bondage of sin in our lives. You see, sin puts a stop to prayer, but prayer puts a stop to sin. Sin puts a stop to prayer, but prayer puts a stop to sin. And seeing people freed from sin and live in right relationship with God is actually to be one of the main motivations of our prayer. Look back to verse 3 of our passage It says, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. If you are a Christian, it is expected that you will be one who makes Christ known. Now, like the Great Commission where the risen Christ told his apostles to go into all the world to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that he had commanded, And just like we see here in in Paul's words, it's easy for us to think that the proclaiming is somebody else's job. Paul, in fact, here says, hey, you know, pray for us, something specific. Can, Can you pray for us so that we can do this specific thing? But of course, we know that these commands weren't intended just for the apostles. Why? Because they're all dead and you and I have heard about Jesus, right? Somebody else had to tell us about Jesus. There isn't an apostle who crossed the Atlantic and made their way to, uh, you know, to North America and somehow spread the word. There isn't an apostle who's going to go to your house or to your unbelieving neighbor's house or anywhere else in this region and share the gospel. It's going to need to be Christians like you and I who do that, who make the word known, who proclaim the gospel of Christ. Now, some Christians believe that... uh, Proclaiming the gospel is a gift of those and a responsibility of those who, who have been given the spiritual gift of evangelism or maybe of teaching. You know, they'll, they'll appeal to Ephesians 4.11, which we looked at uh, just a couple of months ago together. And it says, yeah, it was he that gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. And while it's true that God gifts some for ministry as evangelists, he calls all believers to be his witness and provides them with the power to do that. Because they are a witness in their own heart of the transformative power of the gospel. Just like every Christian, regardless of spiritual gift, is to love one another, each believer is to proclaim the gospel, whether or not it is his or her gift of evangelism or preaching or teaching. If you are a Christian, you are an ambassador of Christ, making your king's message known. And what is it we are to proclaim? Well, if you look back at verse 3, we can see that from our text that it is the mystery of Christ. Now, remember the word mystery in the New Testament context isn't used in the same way that we use it today. A mystery in the New Testament world was something that wasn't known, once wasn't known, but has since been revealed. And what had been revealed? Christ. Jesus was the salvation that previously had not been known or understood, but had since been revealed. So what are we to preach? What are we to proclaim? What are we to make known? Christ. 
There are two groups of people that we do this with. Very simply, those who aren't Christians and those who are. And interestingly enough, even though these are two distinct groups of people, the aim is the same, to make Christ known. With those who aren't Christians, we proclaim Jesus as Lord, that it is through his death and resurrection and his alone that we are saved and we are given hope. This is an easy one, right? But if we're honest, most of us struggle to make Christ a part of our conversation with those who aren't Christians. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. I have. Why do we struggle? Well, for one, I think we don't pray about it. We don't pray about it. We simply don't pray that God would equip us with eyes to see the opportunity and empower us by his Holy Spirit with the courage to risk making Jesus known in a world that is hostile to Christ. Maybe you found yourself in one of these situations before. You're at work and a conversation comes up about how ridiculous those Christians are. And instead of in a loving way amidst a hostile environment saying, I'm a Christian, and then explaining what that means, you say nothing at all because it avoids you being labeled as one of them. Maybe you have a neighbor who's going through a rough patch and is wrestling with how to deal with the brokenness of their circumstance. Instead of offering them Christ as the only explanation that can make sense of their situation, you wish them well and maybe give them a pat on the back. It's not that you don't care, of course. It's just that talking about Jesus would be awkward in that situation, wouldn't it? Sometimes it's not fear or awkwardness, but it's a perceived lack of knowing what to say. I mean, we don't want to get this wrong, right? This is the gospel. You don't want to get it wrong. And this is where I think Paul's request in verse 4 is so helpful. Look there. He says, pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Earlier, I mentioned that uh, this past week, I had a conversation with Peter Scheifke, uh, the MP for the area, and he's running for re-election. So again, you'll see his signs around. Uh, the day before my scheduled call with him, I emailed a few people and asked them to pray for me as I spoke with Peter. I asked them to pray that God would open a door for me to proclaim Christ and that I would do so clearly. In the call that I had with Peter, uh, we literally spoke about issues of life and death. You know anything about Bill C6 and C7 and uh, some of the COVID measures? We're talking about issues of life and death. And in doing that, we did not find agreement. <laughs> we did not land in the same spot. Even though I was able to articulate why, as, as Christians, I believe that some of the actions of the government in these things oppose the righteousness of God. We didn't land in the same spot. Now, Peter is a guy uh, at very much the same age and stage as me in life. He has children about the same age as mine, and he has a stressful job where he is forced to find balance between a plethora of competing voices. I know a little bit of what that's like. When our call started, I, I heard the stress of those things uh, in his voice because I have struggled over the past year with some aspects of those same stresses. I could empathize with aspects of his suffering. As our conversation was winding down, I knew we were going to be closing soon. I asked Peter if, if I could pray for him. There was a pause on the other end of the line. It went on almost long enough that I said, hello? <laughs> you know that kind where you know, you're just waiting like, it's about time that I say something else because it's just a bit long. It was the kind of pause that told me that he was not expecting prayer to be a part of our conversation. You see, most people who aren't Christians, and sadly even some who are, have never had somebody pray for them by name. After the pause, longer than, you know, might have made us, either of us feel comfortable, uh, Peter kind of collected himself and said, uh, sure, I'll, I'll take whatever good anyone wants to send my way. I'll take that. So I prayed for Peter and his wife and his children amidst the flurry of activity that, and all the demands that a re-election campaign I pray that God would, as far as Peter would pursue justice and righteousness, sustain him in the role that he has. When I was done, the, the little bit of awkwardness that was in Peter's voice when he agreed for me to pray for him, it was gone. In a very genuine tone, he said, thank you for praying for me. Um, when this is all done, I'd love it if we could get together because I think we probably have a lot to talk about. 
You know that, that praying for someone in their hearing is one of the easiest ways to proclaim the gospel. Even if it feels scary, the lead in is simple. And let me, let me give it to you, okay? Here, here's a really just simple way. Somebody's sharing something with you and they're not a believer. Hey, I don't know if you know this, but, but I'm a Christian. And as a Christian, I, I pray to God. Can I pray for you just right now about some of the things that, that you just shared with me? 9.9 times out of 10, they're going to say yes. They're going to say yes. It's just that 9.9 times out of 10, we don't offer. You see, there are plenty of ways that we can be an expression of the gospel through our actions. But sharing the gospel message itself actually requires words. And so we are right to pray for one another that we should proclaim Christ with clarity at the family get-together, in our schools, in our workplaces, and in our neighborhoods. Now, despite my saying this, some of you are still going to feel hesitant to walk someone through the fact that the real problem that they face in their life is one of sin, and that Jesus is the only solution to that problem. If that's the case for you, then, then let me offer you another option here. Because I think sometimes we need to build up to these things if it's not been a practice of ours. Why not simply invite them to church with you sometime? Say, hey, we'll, have you ever been to church before? Would you like to come to church with us? Would you like to come to church with me? Even now, we can still have people into our homes. So if you're comfortable with that, you can say, would you like to come to church with us and then maybe come to our house for lunch after? We'd love to have you over. Invite them here where we, where we open the Bible and talk about God's grace. Invite them here where they're going to meet other Christians. Invite them here where we sing about our love for Jesus. Invite them here where we speak openly about our struggle with sin and the forgiveness that we have been afforded in Christ. Remember, we are a hospital for sinners. We are not a museum for saints. In fact, let me begin to encourage you to think about who you know who is not a Christian who you could invite to church. At the beginning of November, uh, we're going to begin a journey through the Gospel of Luke. Beginning of November, we're going to start through the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to find ourselves in Luke's Gospel so that together we can re-engage Jesus and invite others to do that with us. Most people have heard of Jesus, but they've never heard his words. They've never heard them spoken about in the context of the Gospel. So I'm, I'm saying this now, so we got lots of runway here to get this plane off the ground, lots of runway. Start thinking about who you can invite to join you here in hearing about Jesus. We proclaim the gospel to those who don't know it, but we also proclaim the gospel to one another. And how do we know this to be true? Let me ask you this. What does the New Testament do? It makes Jesus known. It makes Jesus known. It makes Christ known, and it speaks about who Jesus is and how he is to be followed. Now, who is the primary audience of the New Testament? Christians. People like you and me. It's Christians. People who already believe in Jesus. In fact, while the Apostle Paul spent a great deal of time on, on missionary journeys that sought to bring the gospel to places, it was not he spent even more time proclaiming and explaining the gospel to those who had already believed it. In some cases, he, he stayed several years in one place helping those who had confessed Christ possess him in the fullness of their mind and action. And brothers and sisters, hear me as I say this. We proclaim the gospel, gospel to one another far too infrequently. We don't, pro, if, if we don't actually proclaim the gospel at all sometimes. But we should, with clarity. We should do this to one another. Because you and I, as Christians, need the gospel. As you can imagine, serving as a pastor among you, I have lots of conversations with people who share with me the struggles of their life. Those things which they feel hurt or shame about. Sometimes it's past abuses. Sometimes it's current addictions. Sometimes it's the consequences of sinful actions they've taken or the sinful actions that others have taken against them. Most times people are coming to talk about these things because they're stuck and they don't know how to get out of the mess that they're in. I can't seem to clear my head on this. They can't see through the fog of the conflict they are facing. 
when a person coming to me says that they are a Christian, the one question that I have found to be the most helpful, far and above any other question I could ask is this. And hear this one because I think it would be good for you to be able to ask of yourself or ask of others. How does your being a Christian shape how you should be thinking, feeling, and responding to this situation? In other words, how does your knowing Jesus speak to this storm? How does the gospel speak to the conflict at hand? How does the gospel speak to my fear? How does the gospel address my anxiety? How does the gospel speak to my sadness in the face of great loss? How does the gospel offer me hope when I feel the weight of my own sinfulness? And sometimes the answer I get is, I I don't know. I don't know. And do you know what my response is? What your response should be? Whatever their response? To proclaim Christ. To proclaim Christ with clarity, just as we should. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. COVID has been a disaster for many churches. And from my perspective, many have been decimated because the systems they had built only worked when the world they knew had a sense of stability to it. Others have been decimated as a result of the shaky faith that they had to start with. One that reduced the gathering of God's people to be on par with the meeting up of a social group of one form or another. The main things... Prayer and proclamation were not the main things. But what stabilizes our shaky world is the gospel. And what calms our hearts, which are troubled, other than prayer. Striving to be a church that prays and proclaims will establish a lasting health. It'll give us a health that a fourth wave or a 40th wave of COVID cannot topple. May God work in us and through us these two markers of discipleship, of prayer and proclamation, both for our good and also for his glory. Would you join me as I pray? Father in heaven, we thank you that um, by your spirit, you afford us the power to make your word known. We thank you that because of Christ, We come before you now and pray in his standing. Father, open our eyes to the opportunities to pray for one another and to make the gospel which we profess known. God, give us opportunities to pray for those and to proclaim to those who are not yet Christians. Give us courage to speak into situations, even into one another's lives where we know that the only answer is Jesus. Give us courage to do this where we might not feel comfortable and work through these things by your spirit as you said you would for our good and for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.